So um, I am Jacqueline Fuller, and I'm president of Google.org, which is Google's philanthropy. Um, but I'm here today mostly because I'm a friend of Justin Dillon's. And um, so I have the honor of giving just a brief introduction before we bring him on to talk to all of us. So um, Justin is uh, one of the coolest guys I know. And uh, he started out as a musician, he's an artist, he's also a change agent who has thought very deeply about the issue of slavery and trafficking among po poverty and many others. Um, and we actually partnered together and really got to know each other when Google.org helped with Slavery Footprint, which um, was something that his team put together to help create a movement around modern day slavery. And it was just a very simple tool that allowed consumers around the world, over 30 million people, is that right? To find out how many slaves were involved in just making our lifestyles happen. What I love about Justin is on a topic such as that, I work with people across the board, um, from policy folks to people who are on the ground in India thinking about issues like modern day slavery. But Justin's the kind who comes to that sort of challenge and questions and thinks, how can we address this in a, the most creative way um, possible so that we can reach deeply into everyone's story, into everyone's narrative, and think about inviting them into uh, a day with purpose, a life with meaning. And so that we're not just talking at them about an issue, but we're inviting them down this path and this journey where their life also finds meaning while they're helping with this issue. And that's the topic um, of the book that he has written recently. I uh, read it when it was in the galley stages and I thought, this is so incredible. Um, this book uh, really, I think, resonates with where uh, a lot of us are. And in fact, um, if you look at happiness research, which is kind of a you know, new cottage industry, is just looking, what does the data say about what makes us content, what gives us well-being and happiness as human beings? Um, a lot of what we're learning um, is actually reflected in that book. And it's about finding deeper meaning, uh, about finding purpose in life through serving others, through being part of movements, by being part of taking on global challenges. So I think it's a, an incredibly timely book. Um, I've given it as gifts to many people, including uh, my daughters, who are both recently graduated from college and really thinking about vocation in life. Um, but I'm just really excited to welcome Justin to, to the stage today on behalf of uh, Bennett and many other friends of Justin's across Google. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Um, I appreciate it. One of the, greatest, the things that I appreciate most about Google uh, is not just your products, but the phone calls that I get to be on, because every one of them is 30 minutes long. And uh, so I, I, I'm going to give that promise back today. I'm going to do everything I can to keep all of this amazing information I'm about to give you within 30 minutes. <laughs> and, if, and, and we can do Q&A afterwards, but it's, it's really not going to hurt my heart if we don't. Today, we're going to talk about a few things. But I promise you that today, we're going to tell two stories. We're going to talk about two different types of poverty. And I'm going to offer you three takeaways for your life that actually do affect your life. Because I know the topic of purpose seems very meta and out there, and actually it has much more to do with how you run your life than you might think. I actually believe that the most powerful force in our lives is the lens through which we see ourselves. How we view our lives in relation to how the world works is actually nuclear. It's, it's very, very important about how we look and see how we not only operate our lives, but how our lives matter to those that we've never met. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, I want to talk about um, one of my most favorite topics, which is live music. And I often think, you know, if there was one show that I could have been at that I was either too young or was not living in the, in, in the right uh, time and place, you know, what would that show be? You know, you know it was, for me, it was seeing Led, like Led Zeppelin at the Forum was, uh, or getting to see like the Beatles anywhere, right? Um, who, who else? What, what's a show? Daniel, who, I know you. Who would you? Who didn't you get to see that you would have loved to have seen? Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, where? Monterey Jazz or um, like the Guitar on Fire. Yeah, probably Monterey. Okay. Anyone else? Is there a show that you would have loved to have seen that you didn't get to see? Yes. Well, you got Mexican singer called Juan Gabriel. Uh, 
Also my favorite. There's a lot of grief in the room. Yeah, we're going to get through that. We're going to get through that. Well, there was one show in particular that, that I wish I could have seen. It was at a place called Examination Hall, which is Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland, specifically on October 21st, 1977. And Trinity Hall, or excuse me, uh, Examination Hall at Trinity College isn't necessarily, the, uh, it's not the forum, it's, or it's not Monterey Jazz, it's not Oakland Coliseum. It's actually a room where students take tests. And it was the room of a very, very, very important concert that actually affected my life and affected the lives of, of, of many people that I know. And when you think about a room like this, it's like got large cathedral halls, it's very narrow, it's very boring. But inside this room, on October 21st in 1977, about 1,200 uh, Dublin teenagers came in from Dublin, Ireland. I'm sorry if I didn't tell you, but it's Dublin, Ireland. But Dublin teenagers came in to see what was to become the very first punk rock show in Ireland. Now, these kids have given way, like every kid, they're looking for context in their lives, they're looking for a way to express themselves against what was going on around them, and frankly, they were tired of like handlebar mustaches and disco polyester pants, so they did something new, and they decided to tear those pants, and you know, do like Cleopatra-inspired mascara, and do Anglo-European mohawks to be able to go to this show. It was a big, big, big event, and more importantly, what was important to understand at the time in Dublin, Ireland, what was happening in Ireland. It was a place that was trying to find its national identity really once again. You know, just about 88 miles north of the venue in Belfast was a, t was a place of, as many of you know, fantastic sec uh, sectarian violence. Uh, there was terrorist attacks, you know, like Molotov cocktails, gun uh, you know, gunshots. Um, that was an average Tuesday for people in the north. So, Really, Ireland at this point was a place of trying to find itself through violence, through nationalism. I don't know if any of that sounds familiar to you at all. But in this side, this room, th these, these students were trying to figure out who they were. And the band that was coming on stage in, in uh, 1977 was a new punk band called The Clash. Now, if you're under 40, you probably don't know who they are. Uh, but this was a band that had only been around at this point for just like one year. And the lead singer, I'm not sure if, oh, he's the guy in the middle. His name is Joe Strummer. Had actually been born a child of privilege. You know, Joe Strummer was a diplomat's son whose parents dropped him off at a, at a uh, basically to be raised by, uh, by another school. And he realized that privilege wasn't the way that he wanted to live. So when he got out of high school, he started to living in the south side of London. He lived with the disenfranchised and the minorities and actually became an advocate in his own way. And his advocacy was to find a way to play music. And that's how... Uh, the Clash got started. And so when Joe got started, really, it was a way of being able to express what was inside of him and bring it to others. And punk rock really became the recipe, and the Clash were just the chefs. Now, it's important to note that what was happening behind the band, and this is obviously Belfast in 1977, but this is a, con this is a picture of the, of the tour in which they were playing at this time on, on October 21st, 1977. And what was behind the band is a backdrop of a picture of a race riot in London. And this is where black communities were coming together to be able to uh, stand up for their rights. And these disenfranchised minorities were really a big part of who Joe was standing up for and the Clash was standing up for. In fact, really what's interesting about the Clash is that they were a white band playing to white audiences about black music. And when Joe stepped up to the mic for the first time, the crowd went wild because he yelled out, white riot. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna, not going to sing the other words, because you don't want that. But I'm going to read them to you. White riot, I want a riot. White riot, a riot of my own. Black people got a lot of problems, but they don't mind throwing a brick. White people go to school where they teach you how to be thick. You see, what Joe was saying to this mainly white audience was that black people have to riot. They have to riot to survive. But white people don't. And as a person who has grown, he had grown up with privilege, his message was, if you can't find your own riot, if you can't stand up for something, you're going to live a half-life. You're just going to be another, in his words, another thick bloke. His message to everyone, and our message today, is to find your riot. 
Find something to stand up for. Find something bigger than yourself. Now, back in the back of examination hall were four teenagers who were taking this all in as if it was like you know, a messianic prophetic preacher at a, at, a, at a tent evangelist show. They were just looking at this and just being blown away at everything that they were seeing. And they realized inside of them that this, this was it. This was their message. They were going to find their riot. And again, you know, anyone under 40 years old probably won't know who they are, but they were just here a few months ago. They went on to become U2. This band found their riot, and they realized that it wasn't just about what you do and how you live and what you get, but it's about how you leverage who you are and what you are and what you're good at for the problems of other people who can never repay you. Purpose isn't happiness, and we're going to talk a little bit further about that today. But these lads were able to find it, were able to find their riot. Purpose is a big word, and it's one that I think we don't pay enough attention to. I actually believe that we're living in a global purpose crisis. Only today we have infinite suitors coming at us at all times of the day, promising purpose, but in reality, we're just being offered amusement. You see, many of us have reached the very top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and we're no longer foraging for food and for shelter. We're foraging for something that matters in our lives. I think this guy said it best, that he who has a why can endure anyhow. And I actually believe that standing up for something that you want changed in the world is actually not noble or selfless or otherly or something to be respected. It's actually selfish, and it's actually survival. Because the only way that you're going to be able to find true purpose is to take on the problems of others. You see, in this equation, purpose is our why to live, not just our how. We're handling everything's every day. The promise is how to be healthy, ha- promise us how to be happy and healthy. And these are our how, but they're not, they're not our why. And the pursuit of happiness is pretty straightforward. It's found through acquiring and achieving. But how do we find our why? How do we find our purpose? I've had a book out for a few months. And you know, you don't really pay attention to the people who you don't know that read it. You pay attention to the people who you do know who read it. And specifically, you really pay attention to the people who you do know who haven't read it, because that's where it gets personal. And one person in particular, and I actually have to say, this friend of mine is someone, I won't say who he is, he's actually someone I kind of wrote the book for, like the archetype of the type of person. And he told me, he's like, you know, this is great and all, but I've got like bills to pay, and I've got kids to get through school, and I've got all the rest of it. And purpose and meaning, frankly, they sound otherly. They sound meta. I hear people tell me this all the time. It's like, yeah, I'll eventually, I'll buy a Tesla, but it's not for right now. That's what purpose is. It's a Tesla in most people's lives. This is because we think of an understanding that the why of our life, the pursuit of meaning, is somehow extra, something that we can figure out once we have our how, once we have everything that we feel like we need. There's lots of definitions for purpose, but this is the one that I find the most helpful. Purpose isn't how much you can give or what you can donate or what cause you're associated with. Listen to this. It's finding what the world needs from you. Finding out what the world needs from you. Here's the thing. Charity's going to tell you, and I've run one for 10 years, will tell you that the world needs you to give to support that. I actually don't believe that. They need you to give, and it's extremely important that we all support charities. But that's not purpose. You were designed to fix problems in the world. If you aren't fixing your own, per- your own needs of just having to put a roof over your head and food on the plate, you're actually designed and your purpose is to fix the needs and fix the problems of others. It's not ancillary. It's actually a big, big part of your why. So the point of my book and the point of my talk is to try to solve a lot of problems at once. What if we could change the world and improve our lives. 
You see, my friend who doesn't have time for this, he just needs to make him, he's got problems in his life. Those are more important, and frankly, I, I don't argue with him. But he's missing out because he doesn't know what the world needs from him. What if we could solve our how to live problems while also solving our why am I here problems while also solving the problems of others who can never pay us back? In my book, I propose a model to be able to help us understand this. And I've actually arranged all of humanity into two different groups, two different types of poverty. The first poverty is a poverty of means. Now, this is the poverty that most of us are familiar with. This is the poverty that we see on our feeds and we see in the news. We know what this poverty looks like. But I've put a word next to it that I think is helpful for us to understand. And Jacqueline was talking earlier about, in some ways, how I see the world. The word means is very, very important here. Means actually means an action or a system by which a result is brought about. OK, so to break that down, a poverty of means simply means that there's an action or a system that's missing. Poverty is no longer just about a condition, right? It's that something's missing. So when we say that there's 844 million people who don't have access to clean water, what we're saying is there's a poverty of means to wells to offer clean water. When we say there's 400 million people that are suffering uh, just to get, just to, uh, for a basic health, we're saying that there's a poverty of means to medicine and care to that health. When we say that there's 40 million people plus living in slavery today, it's a poverty of means of justice. Now this is the poverty of means that I wrestle with every day. The poverty of justice. We're missing an action or a system where there should be one. My day job is to build a means and to fix a system that allows children to be exploited every day in order to support our lifestyles. Slavery is reprehensible, and it actually needs more than our attention and our care and our reposts. It's a thriving business. It's a moral outrage because it's a system that works. So it needs an action or a system to make it stop working. This is extremely evident when I visit places like Ghana, out on Lake Volta. And I meet little boys like this, Ebenezer, who works on a boat every day for 17 hours a day to catch fish. He's controlled by a master. Ebenezer is suffering a, a poverty of means. And so is his little brother, who's asleep at the top of the boat. And when I talk to his master, who's in the red shirt, and I ask him, why is this little boy working and not in school, his answer to me is, if he doesn't work, I don't eat. I'm sorry, but that's also a poverty of means. So you can get how slavery is a hot mess on this planet. And it needs more than just donations. It needs a system, and it needs an action to break it. And it's heartbreaking, but our breaking hearts aren't enough. It actually needs us to step in. The other poverty that I want to talk about is also fantastically insidious. It's a poverty of meaning. This is a poverty that many of us, some of us, certainly people we know, are living beneath its poverty line. It's not one that people talk about very often, because it, but it still claims the lives. I'm going to say it again. It claims the lives of thousands of people every year. It causes disease, uproots communities, and has even played a role in creating a few wars or two. While it doesn't rob us of food or water or medicine or justice, it steals something that's very valuable to us all. We already saw it. It steals our why. It takes away our why to live. And as we learned earlier, it's difficult to know how to live if we don't have a why, if we don't know what the world needs from us. What's scary is that many of us are scraping by in our lives, unaware that this poverty is eating at our heels. And while it doesn't take nearly the amount of lives a year that the poverty of means takes, it's still lethal. We can see it, maybe not directly, but indirectly in the data, where 50% of people on social media between 18 and 34 feel ugly and 
worthless and otherly. And 30% of those people feel extreme amounts of loneliness. In fact, one in five people in America feel extremely and debilitatingly lonely. And all the data that's coming out on loneliness is directing, is, is, is saying to us that is actually creating health problems, heart disease, diabetes. These things are connected. Meaning and health and wealth and how we live are all connected. If we don't know our why and we don't know what the world wants from us, in some ways we perish, not just existentially, literally perish. If anyone understands this existential and physical perishing best, it's Dr. Frankel. Dr. Frankel understood this need better than anyone because he wrote in his popular book, Man's Search for Meaning. If you read it, you'll learn that he was a psychiatrist. It's a very popular book. You might have already actually read it. He was a psychiatrist around World War II that ended up in a concentration camp. And he tasked himself to save the people who were killing themselves. And he knew he could tell when someone was going to kill themselves because they started smoking their cigarettes. You see, cigarettes in concentration camps were currency. You didn't smoke them. You traded them for things you needed, like food or a day off from work. But when you started smoking, the only thing of value you have in your life, Dr. Frankel knew, that they were close to committing suicide. And his primary argument with every one of them was that the world needed something for them. There was still something that the world needed from them. It was his main argument inside of a concentration camp to help people understand not just a poverty of means, but their own poverty of meaning. His message, like Joe's, is the same. The world wants something from you. The world wants your riot. It wants you to know. It wants to know what you care about and actually wants you to act on it. If we don't find our riot, we suffer, and the world around us misses a chance to improve. Your riot is the voice inside of you that says, I wish something was different in the world. Now, I found my riot later in life. I came upon the issue of human trafficking, and it hijacked my heart. And I had every opportunity to keep moving with what was then a music career. But I said, you know, I just, I'm going to give this thing that's inside of me a little bit of gas. Not a lot. I don't want to change my life. I don't want to do this for 10 years, even though I have. I don't want to do that. I'm just going to, I'm just going to lob one over the fence. I'm going to try something. Because what I saw working around this issue 10 years ago, what I saw people doing, didn't, frankly, didn't seem like enough. And at the time, I was a part of the music community. And I'm like, well, if you can't have a movement without music, let's, let's get it on. And so I pulled a bunch of musicians together during Grammys week in 2007. And I said, let's, here was my business plan. <laughs> let's make some, let's film some performances, and then let's give them away. And we'll talk about slavery on top of it. That was my business plan. And actually, people agreed. And so people came <laughs> to a studio in Santa Monica and filmed these beautiful performances for me that I had no idea what to do with. And after two days of filming, I'm like, wow, that went really good. Like, people really love doing this. Guess what? People actually love doing what they're good at to help others. I think we're on to something. And so I decided to do it again. I did it in New York, and then in Austin, and in London. And all these musicians started coming together. And then I thought, well, we should get some smart people to talk about it. So let's call up Nick Kristoff, and Dr. Cornell West, and Madeline Albright. And I quickly learned how you know, films like Borat get made, because no one checks. They let you in to interview people. It's amazing. They check now. But no one checked back then. And I was able to interview these very important people and learn something and allow them to contribute their voices. We made a movie. And the movie went through theaters. Now I'm two years in. <laughs> My music career is way behind me at this point. And then we make some websites, like Slavery Footprint. And then we make some, some documentaries. And on and on it goes. And people continue to get involved. And then we made something really exciting, enterprise software. Oh my gosh. <laughs> enterprise software that helps businesses identify forced labor in their supply chains. In 10 years, 
Folks, I used to count to four and rhyme for a living. That was music. When you reach out and you take a step towards your riot, you have no idea what you're capable of. You have no idea how powerful your how operates in this world. That is how you find purpose, by taking on the problems of others who can not ever possibly pay you back. I want to talk about how to find your riot. You know, we hear this all the time. It's like, that's great, find your purpose, all the rest of it. Not very many people give us a way in which we can take a step towards that. And I want to introduce you to someone who, uh, to me, uh, just lives finding your riot better than anyone else. It's probably someone you've never heard of. Her name is Alice Harris. And she grew up, a, she grew up in the late 19th century. And her dream, her dream was to be a missionary to Africa. And she met a man, John, and they got sent to what was then the free state of Congo, which happened to be a territory in Africa that was not yet colonized, one of the largest territories in Africa around you know, 1900. And there she, they did their missionary work, um, very noble work. Actually, it was a part of a larger system because at the time, there was a lot of work to be able to help educate and bring science to the region, which actually turned out to be uh, a ploy. But they were doing their bit. They were doing what they are good at, and they were doing their life the way they saw fit. And one day, when John was away on business, her husband was away on business, they had no children. When John was away on business, uh, one of the local tribes people uh, came to her door and said, I really want to see you. Um, I want to see you specifically. His name was Nasala. And Nasala came up and said, I have something to show you. And she came and he set it out, and he brought this plantain leaf, and he set it out onto her veranda. He's like, I, I, I need you to see what's happening. And so she walked up, and it's you know, really, um, let me go back here. Um, as she came upon the open plantain leaf that Nasala brought, she realized that it was the severed hand and foot of his daughter. I'm going to stop there and tell you why that happened. See, over in Belgium, there was this mad king called King Leopold II. And he was very jealous of all the other leaders in Europe because everyone else got to colonize Africa, and he didn't. And actually, colonization at this point in history People were starting to look down on it. Slavery is kind of illegal-ish. And so he had to figure out a way to get his own land grab. So he created a company, basically an institute, that was able to go in and quote, unquote, bring science and education to this entire region. But what it really was was a ploy to be able to start pulling out the natural resources that were in the Congo. And he named it the Free State of Congo, believe it or not. And what he did was he set up a police force called the Force Publique who would go out and take land from local tribes people and then force them to work the land. And in fact, what they were really finding was one of the hottest commodities that was coming out of Congo at this time was rubber. And rubber was in big demand because bike tires and automobiles were just really getting started. And basically, what, what Leopold was doing was creating this illicit business in slavery and just making a fortune. But he was a total cheapskate. Total cheapskate. He wanted an accounting of every single bullet that his force used. So he required them, because he was afraid that they were going to go out and use bullets to go hunt game for themselves and whatnot. So what he required is, if you're going to shoot a bullet, I need to see a hand or a foot to prove that you killed someone. And the force public got kind of smart about it, and so they figured, well, let's just get ahead of the game. Let's go hack off hands and feet and get ahead. That way our accounting system will work when we come back at the end. And that's how you get in a solid story. So here Alice is looking at what's happening on her door. And on that veranda, on those steps, in that moment, she found her riot. She found her purpose. And here's the takeaway. This is what she did. She walked back inside. She grabbed the coolest thing she had, which was a Kodak Brownie camera, which was the coolest piece of tech you could have at the time. And it was affordable. And she took that picture. I'll show you again. And she didn't stop there. She went on taking more and more pictures. And she started documenting the atrocities that were happening 
all over Congo. No one else was doing this at the time. And she realized that something inside of her was happening. Guess what she didn't do? She didn't ask anyone's permission. Don't you think you'd want permission to go try to take down a European leader? That sounds like something you would want to call in a professional for or get something a little bit bigger than a demure missionary from England. But she kept going. And then she realized, in order to get the word out, because Leopold was fighting her left and right in the papers to keeping her pictures from getting out, so she said, forget it. I'm going to go on a Magic Lantern tour, which is essentially you know, the 1900s version of PowerPoint. And she took her pictures all around America, all around England, and started getting the attention of Mark Twain and the president and the queen of England. And with a very short amount of time, his entire reign was shut down. And he was no longer able to exploit the people of Congo. This one woman found her riot and took a step and was able to change an entire system, a poverty of means, purely because she was able to do something without permission. So the takeaway that I give you today is that when you look for your riot, my riot is obviously human trafficking. Our riots don't need to be in a faraway place. Your riot, the thing that could bug you is the fact that not enough kids in your neighborhood have parents helping them with their homework because they all work and have two jobs and they're too busy. That's a riot. It doesn't have to be something this big. And if it's a thing that bothers you, if it's a thing inside of you that says, I wish the world was this way, I want to challenge you you might be the one to fix it. She could have left Nasala on the porch and said, I'm so sorry, I'll go write a letter. I'll do what I can. Instead, she grabbed what she already had, the talent and the skills and the possessions that she already had and started working on it. Anyone, anyone in here can find their riot and act on it as long as they don't ask permission and just choose to use what you already have. When Dr. King, when Dr. King gave his message at Oberlin College, he spoke to this need for meaning. He called it an inescapable network of, mutual, of mutuality. And he said that I am not who I'm supposed to be until you are who you're supposed to be. And you're not who you're supposed to be until the person next to you is who they're supposed to be. And in a global village like we live in today, that axiom is true on a global scale. We actually find ourselves when we give ourselves away to people's problems who can never pay us back. That is your path to purpose. And that is how you find your riot. And I want to thank you all for letting me have this time to be able to do this. Thank you so much. So thank you. So Bennett, uh, Bennett is the one that set this up. Thank you so much. Your love. This is somebody who found his riot and is a living example of someone who makes a difference every day, and I want to thank you for that. You don't shake it off. You're just doing that. Any questions for the author? Here. Thank you. Thank you for coming and for the very inspiring talk. Uh, I wanted to get your perspective on uh, kind of finding the right riot and kind of the analysis paralysis of waiting for the right one or just doing something. And it comes from the perspective of uh, once life gives you a lot of training, uh, sometimes it takes long to find something. As I say, this is really using the most leverage that I got. So I struggle a lot and probably others like, sometimes I feel like I'm waiting kind of for that bigger thing. Uh, and, and, and the motivation for that is like, maybe it is wasted that I just, do, I just help in some capacity that didn't use like all the unique skills and stuff that life had given me. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on how do you feel uh, one can uh, maybe f go through that process where ultimately you, you end up using all of what you got and how do you get there? Like do you start very small and then grow to it or do you, I don't know, th keep on thinking on quote unquote your strategy and your large, large scale high impact so on and so forth. So just, just curious how uh, or if you think, hey, maybe you shouldn't use all of your skill, it's okay just to underutilize maybe what life has given you and, and it's also okay, so. Yeah, it, those are great questions. Um, 
I actually believe that change happens at small scale. Um, you know, part of the thing about writing a book and putting movies out, it, it just, it, it makes it seem really glamorous. And I'm fortunate to have um, my favorite person in the world, my wife here today, and she can attest to you that there's just like very little glamour um, in, in, you know, trying to change the world. It is, it is a million small steps in trying to make a difference. And, and also doing things that you are interested in but aren't necessarily good at. Do you, I mean, does Google still have that thing where you like, what, 20 or 30% of the time to work on things that really? Do you use it? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, some great things have come out of that, of that model. And I would argue that there's some very, very talented folks here. And if you've got that level and that wide of a, of a birth of uh, the opportunity to, to try things, I, I think you can create some wonderful things here with this network. But, but again, and I know it's, it's weird to say this Google, but I really do think you have to think small. You, you know, like people come to me all the time, it's like, let's do a concert, or let's create an app that ends slavery. It's like, you know, let's just get a few companies to look at their supply chain. Wow, that's boring. My goodness, is it so impactful. We're not like playing with thousands of dollars now, we're playing with billions, you know? But it's not, it's not as sexy as like, so I think that we really do need to scale back our ambitions around what something looks like and put more of our ambition to like, what's something that can just help out a little? You know, helping out a kid with their homework, it seems like a little, but it's a lot. It's fantastic. So I think we have to kind of divorce ourselves from the idea that all change is glamorous. Hi. Um, I was just wondering how you measure your impact. Is it like in a financial system as we are current uh, used to? You know, like by, you know, over by quarter by quarter, this kind of stuff. Or do you base as well in public policies implementations, for example, in sustainable development goals for the UN? I used to work for the UN, and then I moved to Google. I, to, I did like some partnerships back in Brazil with yeah. indigenous communities, but then, I see our public policies going backwards, you know, like yeah. I see the indigenous rights in Brazil, for example, you know, being disrespected. Yeah. So um, I'm glad to hear from you as well yeah. about that. Yeah, I think change is juggling chainsaws and walking. That's what it looks like. Because one chainsaw is public policy, one chainsaw is the marketplace, one chainsaw is the economy of attention. It's very expensive to get into. We can, it isn't just one thing. And you know, the last 10 years, we've seen enormous growth, an enormous uh, difference made around slavery. But I can't tell you how many rooms I've been in, important rooms, like you know, rooms you've heard of, where people slam their hand on the table and say, you're not doing enough. And then they go back to their you know, pulpit, or they go back to their, to their desk and go back on with their job. Because people expect when something's really bad, like slavery, that it should just be fixed very easily. It's entrenched in everything we do. And so it requires some move, a little bit of movement on policy, some movement in the marketplace, some movement around consumers. I mean, in the work that we do. And I would assume it's the same everywhere else. For us, we had to like roll it all back. As a, as a company, we had to roll it all back to like, what does change look like for us? Oh, guess what? It's really boring. It actually means how many companies are looking at how many of their suppliers and measuring where slavery might be in that supply chain. And it turns out that as we started moving towards that as a company and trying to figure out how to measure that, because you can't fix a problem you can't measure, and there, to my knowledge, there has been no census on slaves since like maybe 150 years ago. So how do you measure a problem? How do you fix a problem you can't measure? So we're measuring it for companies and actually giving them a way to be able to step forward. Now the lights went on. Now we can actually look at how we can fix a problem that's been with us for a long time and probably will continue. So it, it does take a bit of iteration, but I think sometimes people just go hard on public policy being, oh, if we can just get a law passed, that'll be it. And it's just, that's just one chainsaw, in my opinion. Did all of those like weird metaphors help at all? Because I, I, I don't get the sense they did. We can, we can sidebar. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? So you talked about the supply chain for companies. Where is your company going, and where do you need the help in your company itself? Uh, we, 
we just need as many companies using our software as possible. We're the only software out there that can measure slavery beyond the first tier supplier. And actually, most people will say, oh, we've, you know, we're talking to all of our first tier suppliers. There's 10,000, there's 20,000, they're all good. It's usually not where the problems are. We actually need to be able to use optics, the optics we provide, to be able to push beyond tier one and understand where the problems are and get those relationships between buyer and seller to kind of push further and change behavior in the supply chain. And we're seeing it happen at a very large scale. But it is going to take uh, the coalition of the willing, so to speak, in the marketplace to all work together. And in a competitive marketplace where one company doesn't want to share other secrets, this isn't something you want to, I'd like for people to be competitive on slavery, but competitive on knowing where it is and ending it. That's the best way to be competitive on this. Yeah. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks everyone who, who are watching. If you want to get the, uh, there's some books in the back, there's books online, A Selfish Plan to Change the World. Thanks man. Thank you.